Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16. Least there be any fornicators or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat. Uh, 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 I'm not done. For one morsel of meat sold his birthright. See, every one of us have a spiritual birthright. And he sold it for basically a cup of soup. Go on, verse, next verse, there you go, thank you. For you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessings, and we'll get to all that in just a moment, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance. Now that is a sad scripture right there. He found no place of repentance. My God. Though he sought it carefully, he found no place of repentance. Though he sought it carefully with tears. Genesis chapter 33, 8 and 9, and then after that you can be seated. I have a heavy burden today. Sometimes I come to the pulpit with a light-hearted, joyous, joyful attitude and countenance, but to, today I, I feel a heaviness. And I hope that you will allow me to deliver my soul today. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife themselves. I'm sorry, 33 and 8. I guess say that didn't sound right. And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of the Lord. Esau is the one asking the question, what, what, what means all this? And Esau said, you guys, you need to quit changing that so early. <laughs> I say that with a smile. <laughs> what me? <laughs> uh, nobody's going to want to work back here ever again. <laughs> but I, I do say it in joking. Brother John knows me. And he said, what meanest this by all of this that I met? Esau was saying, you know, and, and, and I'll, I'll explain the story to you, how that uh, uh, Jacob had sent a bunch of stuff out to him because he was afraid that Esau was going to kill him. And he said, well, well, well why did you do all this? These are to find, and, and then Jacob said, these are to find grace in your sight. I don't want you to kill me, dude. Verse 9. Thank, thank you, Brother John. And, e and Esau said, I have enough. Oh, 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 now, I'm, I'm going to dwell on that in just a moment. Esau said, I have enough. I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto yourself. I don't need anything. I don't need anything. Father, help us do a great job in a short time. All I ask that you allow me to deliver my soul. And when, and when I am finished today, I can feel the burden of my heart lifted. Ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Don't put the title up yet because I'll, I want to get to a certain place you can be seated. 
Please allow me for the sake of clarity. I will place the proper noun substitute then for the pronoun in this verse so that you understand exactly, exactly who is speaking. Amen. I, I, and, I, and I will do it this way. And Esau said, and Jacob said, and Esau said, Esau said, I have enough. I want you to keep that in mind just for a minute. I've got enough. I don't need any more. I've got all I need. Got all I need. I want to look at two glimpses of the same man. Hebrew reference uh, to him many years before in the incident in Genesis chapter 3. Hebrews tells us that after Esau had lost everything that meant anything to him, the Bible said that he sought to find a place to repent and to restore himself, weeping and crying carefully. Searching for a place of repentance. Yet a few years later, now I want, I want you to get the contrast here. A few years later, we are afforded another glimpse of this man. Amen. When he makes a very strange statement to his brother Jacob that, that wants to give him some gifts. Amen. So he would not kill him. And he said, I don't need, I don't need anything, amen, that you have. I have all that I need. I have enough. And I would like to preach to you on this theme today. Learning to live without God. Learning we can put that up there when you get it. Learning to live without God. It is in fact, my, mankind has learned to adapt to almost any situation that he finds himself into. We, we, we take pride in that. I mean, there, there, there's idiots that will climb a mountain and try to uh, ski down the whole mountain. And, and <clears throat> there, are, there are different situations that we find man finds himself into. Amen. And, and un, maybe even un, unknowns to him that he could even endure such a thing. He gets through it. We've heard about individuals that during a tornado and, and five and six and seven days later, they find the individual still alive. Amen. We have learned to adapt to things in our life, amen, that we did not even think that we could do. Amen. To adapt to almost any situation which we find ourselves, no matter what he lacks, there's something in man that feels the challenge to, to survive in some of the most deserted places and situation. Man has learned to survive. <clears throat> we watch, uh, of course, I'm a, I, I like sports. Especially my cubbies. <clears throat> but I, I, I like sports. I just had to throw that in there. I, I, I like sports. <clears throat> And um, we have watched it before, and, and we have seen them doing strange things, you know. And my wife goes, what would possess an individual to do that? And I, I'm looking at her like, well, 40 years ago, I might have tried it myself. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, there's something about age and wisdom. And youth and stupidity. Hello? Do, do, do you think it's by coincidence that whenever our army wants men to go to war, that they like the 18 and 19 and 20 year old men rather than the 40 and 50 year old men? Let me tell you why. Because whenever they give a command, amen, that young buck is going to, or that young lady is going to stand up and say, I can handle that challenge. I can take. And we that are older go, let's rationalize this a little bit. <laughs> Hello. My son jumped out of a plane and, 
and uh, <coughs> which is, you know, t to me, I mean, if you, you want to do that, you, you just go ahead and do it. <coughs> but uh, he, he'd had, that was on his bucket list for years. He wanted to skydive, and so he went to the only airport, and he took lessons, and, and then <coughs> he jumped out, and, of course, uh, somebody jumped out with him the first time, well, the only, oh, the only time he did it, but they jumped out with him, and normally after about 10 seconds, they have him to pull the cord so the parachute will inflate or, you know, blow up and slow him down. And, <clears throat> but he was doing so good with turns, somersaults, you know, and I'm saying, dear Lord, I'm just praying I get to the ground safely and I don't, you know, the parachute does open. And the instructor said, man, you're doing so good. He said, I'm, I'm going to wait another 10 seconds and just let you. And, and he was doing somersaults and, you know, these things and all of that. And then he said, okay, it's time to pull it. And he pulled it and landed. And he said, let's do that again. And the guy said, no, we're, we're done for today. So far as I know, my son only did that one time. But he told me, he said, it was such a rush. Such an adrenaline rush. And I'm thinking, okay. Anybody that would be in a perfectly good airplane and jump out of it is half nuts. <laughs> son or no son, he's half nuts. I know a man <laughs> wanted to do that too. And, uh, and she probably still wants to do it. Yeah, she does. See, nuts. Just for, just for you and me, nuts. <clears throat> I have a hard time flying in a plane now. You know, I'm, I'm there and I'm thinking, well, oh boy, I hope this gets me where I'm going to go. <clears throat> anyway, let's get back to my message. Somehow we have learned to survive. Man has learned to survive. Years ago when I was a, a, a younger person, the Russian uh, cosmonauts uh, went into space and they, sent, they spent six months in space. Now, to me, that's kind of kind of weird because you get up in space and then you, you, you lose all altitude or, or gravity. And, boy, you can, you can fly and float and, and, and do everything else up there. Amen. But somehow, on the other hand, man has learned to adapt. Today, in the bottom of the sea, submarines, amen, where men breathe and live underwater, amen, to a, to a, a large depth they go down. Amen. They go to the highest mountain. They go to the darkest depth of the jungles. They go to the vast deserts. And there's somehow something about man that we have learned to survive no matter what comes our way. And not only in the physical realm, as man learned to live no matter what, and in the emotional uh, arena or area, we have learned to adapt to, to that which you and I might find intolerable. Those learn, uh, learn with large amounts of guilt and remorse and regret. Children, women living under abuse and family struggles just to survive. It's difficult to describe, but man has found a way to survive. Through all of that. And it may only be existing, but nevertheless it's surviving. Mankind has learned to live without almost anything imaginable and still survive. And it's a sad fact that the ultimate of man's survival is that they are people that have learned how to live without God. I must admit to you today that I don't know how they do it. I really don't. You can, you can say that I, I serve a God and that's my crutch. If you want to say that, you go ahead and say it, honey. But I know He's more than my crutch. Amen. He's my Alpha, Omega, my Savior. Amen. The lover of my soul. He cared enough for me that He went to Calvary. And He died there in Calvary. Amen. I have sat alone too many times and felt the stare of depression in, in my own heart. And, and when, <coughs> when there seemed like there's no answer to my needs, I have felt His, oh, I have felt His presence. 
Oh, and his hand to wrap around me, Brother Terry, and said, you know what? You're not alone. You're not alone. I am there with you. I have felt his sweet hand come and place upon my shoulders, and I have heard his sweet voice say, I'm with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I don't know how people can make it without that hand of compassion, but somehow, 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 somehow they do. I sat through too many funerals of loved ones to ever understand how people suffer their loss like that without God, without a comforting presence in their life. But I know that they do. And I don't understand how folks, I just don't understand how folks can make it through a life filled with heartache, disappointment, sorrow, all the things that can go wrong, the, present, the, the pressures that can build from day to day and not have him near them. I don't know how they do it. I really don't know how they do it. Amen. You that are nurses, you have seen the, the tragedy of life. And you have seen those that leaned upon God. And you saw those that did not lean upon God. Amen. You have probably heard those that have cursed God. Amen. Because of their situation. But nevertheless, they endured. They existed. They survived. Amen. But I don't know how man somehow has learned to live without God. Set the record straight. Only Jesus can satisfy the, deep, the deepest of longing in a man's heart. Only Him. I don't care what you, sum, you substitute for God. You will never find the joy and peace and the complete satisfaction that your heart is looking for today. You will never. You will never. Drugs. You'll never take the place of the power of alcohol. Or the power of the Holy Ghost. Excuse me. Alcohol will never satisfy like the Spirit of God. An immoral lifestyle seeking every pleasure that the flesh has to offer will never substitute for knowing the God that lives way down inside of your heart. I don't, I don't, I want you to know that only Jesus can satisfy the deepest hunger of your heart. But somehow, may not be living, but somehow, man has learned to exist and survive without God. Story of a pastor's daughter. She was, she was filled with the Holy Ghost. She had been in church most of her life. Met this young man, and he had not been married, neither one of them. And he put pressure on her, and both quit going to church. They got married. She made this statement, no need for me to try until he's ready. And a preacher found, uh, a preacher friend tried to talk to her into coming back to church. I have made up my mind, not until he does. The preacher asks, what if he never does? The young lady raised in a Christian home, filled with the Holy Ghost, sung in the choir, knew what the power of the Holy Ghost was. Amen. Looked at him without batting an eye, without a quiver in her voice, and said, I guess I will just go to hell. No, you're not going to swing from the chandeliers if we had them today. But like I told you, I've got to, I've got to lift. And I've got to give this burden for my soul. Somewhere down the line, she had learned to live without God. How can you lay on your bed at night and stare up at the darkness of the ceiling and know that the Lord could come before morning light and yet never shed a tear or never feel a fear? All I know is that people have somehow learned to live without God. 
not talking about God giving up on you, but leaving God out of your life and it, until it becomes a habit. I got people that are not here today because leaving God out of their life became a habit. So if you get aggravated to preach or call on you and say, where were you Sunday? You go ahead and get mad because hopefully you'll get glad. I've been down the road too much. I've been down, I saw too much to know that the first step, amen, and somebody backsliding is staying out of church. There's a first service, second service, third service, and the fourth service is easy to stay home. And then before long, you even forget about, you know, in the beginning you felt guilty, you know, Man, I, I ought to be in church today. It's Sunday. I ought to be in church. Amen. But the further you go, it's like, ah, I'm good. I'm good. Probably some of them even said, all there is there in church anyway is hypocrites. Church is not a perfect place. That's when God designed church as a hospital. Have you ever been wrong? I've been wrong more times than I can even count him. So don't go away and say, well, pastor thinks he's perfect. No, I've been wrong more, more than probably most of you. But I have a God. I have a God. That I can go to. See, it's a learned reaction. It does not come over overnight or does not come naturally. Young people feel a need for God and children are very easy to work with because they seem to have an inborn sense of need. Amen. But as life goes on, and it is so easy to learn how to do it without God. Yep, go to work. You used to get up and go to work before you went to work. You used to get up and pray and read the Bible. But now it's just like, hurry, 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 let's go to work. You have learned to do it. See, we don't pray. We don't have no devotions. We make life decision without consulting God's will. Not long we have learned to live, leave God out of our everyday life. I'm preaching a warning to every one of us under the sound of my voice this morning. Because you're here today, that, that you are about to graduate. You've been in your own school of learning how to do it your own way. And you think maybe you don't need God anymore and, and you're about ready to, to learn how to live without Him? Because Esau did. The oldest son of Isaac sold his birthright. Sometime something was lacking in his heart. Jacob had a hunger of the things of God and Esau went out hunting. And he came home tired, and, and he was hungry, and, and uh, he, he met Jacob, and he said, Jacob, give me, I pray. And, and Jacob said, well, let, let, let's make a deal, big brother. Let's deal about this. You got a birthright coming to you from daddy. I want that birthright. You're starving. Give me the birthright, and I'll give you some food. You say, oh, I, I would never do that. Well, wouldn't you? See, it may not be food. It could be something else. Amen. It could be a spouse that pressures you not to come to the house of God. It could be the children that are pressuring you. It could be a parent that's pressuring you. What good is a birthright if I die? Yes, birthright for a bowl of soup. A good lesson for us three and fourth generation Christian needs to learn. There is nothing out there worth losing what we got in here. I've got to say that there's nothing worth losing. Amen. There's nothing out there worth losing what you have in here. 
You've got to understand that. And you've got to get a hold of that. Amen. Because, amen, <clears throat> there's another message I preached. It was only a day's journey. Naomi said, I'm going to leave God's presence here. And I'm going to go over here where there's food. But I'll be back. I'll be back. Because it was only a day's journey there. But when she came back, she had learned to live without God. They did not even recognize her because of the sin that was in her life had wrecked her body in such a way. They said, who are you? She said, well, I'm Naomi. Oh, my God, it didn't recognize you. That wasn't even in my notes, so that, that didn't cost you anything. Esau did. Amen. There's nothing out there worth losing what you have in here. Not one day of pleasure, not one hour of personal satisfaction, not one thing, not one enjoyment, not one activity, not one life's goal that is worth losing what God has given you through this truth. Yes, I'll sell. God honored the transaction. God did. Isaiah was going to transmit the blessing to Esau. And you know how that Esau sent, uh, uh, or Isaac sent Esau out to, to do some deer hunting and get, bring back some deer meat. And Rebekah put animal fur on Jacob and sent him to Isaac with the soup. Amen. Uh, and Isaac, nearly blind, could not tell the difference. All he could do is to feel him. I, I, is that you, Esau? It sounds like Jacob. Come close so I can touch you. Because Esau was a hairy man. And he came and he touched him. He said, you sound like Jacob. But you feel like Esau. And he blessed Jacob. It wasn't until Esau returned from the, from the, from the, uh, the hunt that Isaac realized what had happened. His father said, I'm sorry, I have already given the blessing to Jacob. Esau, standing in the, in the tent uh, doorway, crying and said, Oh, bless me, my father, bless me. I cannot live without your blessings. I cannot go on without your blessings. And the New Testament tells us more about it. Only after he lost it did Esau realize how valuable his birthright really was. He wept and he sought for repentance. Jacob left and spent many years at his uncle Lebanon's house. He was wealthy and had a large family and he, he started home and sold out to God while he was wrestling with the angel. Remember, he wrestled with an angel. And from that point on, Jacob had a limp. Can I tell you something? You, you get fully enwrapped in God, you're going to walk different. You're, you're going to act different. You're going to talk different. You're going to go different places. And after Jacob wrestled with the angel, had a limp. Because he always remembered, I fought with God's angel. Amen. He always remembered. His father said, I'm sorry, I've already given the blessing to Jacob. He wept and sought repentance and he sold out. And the next day they were to meet and Esau angrily wanted to destroy Jacob and Jacob sent out gifts to his brother Esau and, and instead of a swords clashing when they, when they got together they fell on each other's neck and hugged and loved each other and, and wept and cried. After the greeting Esau said what do you mean by sending me all these gifts of animals? Jacob said I did it to find favor in your spirit, to impress you. I give them to you as a gift, and I want you to listen to Esau. And I don't have much more to say. Jacob, I don't need anything at all. 
I don't need what you have. I don't need, I don't want anything else. Somewhere in between standing before his father weeping and seeking repentance on that wind-swept day, when he met Jacob on the way home, Esau had learned how to make it without the blessings of God. He learned how to live without the presence of God until he could remark, I don't even need church anymore. I don't need worship anymore. I don't need the presence of God anymore. I have learned to make it without Him. The danger is not that you will be killed in a judgmental move of the Spirit of God. See, back in the day, that's, that's how we preached it. Well, bless God, if you don't come to this altar today, you may get hit in a car on the way home and you're going to die and go to hell. Some of you know I'm telling you the truth here. <laughs> Some of you know I'm telling you the truth. Amen. But can I tell you, that very seldom happens. Most people don't die in a blazing car crash because they leave God out of their life. Most people just grow colder and colder and harder and harder. They sit on pews and hear preaching that doesn't touch them anymore. They sit and aren't moved by the singing until God is the only, only a distant memory of the good feelings that they used to have. And they walk out of the church for the last time. They marry, they have children, they buy homes, they buy cars, they work their job, and they grow older. They don't die horrible deaths. They just learn how to live without God. They don't want him. They don't desire him. They don't hunger after him anymore. Someone comes and knocks on the door. and I've heard this saying before. Well, I used to be a Christian. I used to be Pentecostal. I used to have the Holy Ghost. I'm not telling you something I haven't heard. Now, the next part I have not heard, but I have learned how to make it without God. I hope it's not true, but stats will say that at the end of this service today, there are some that so desperately need a relationship with God. You have either growing cold in the Lord, you don't pray, you don't fast, you don't read your Bible anymore, your love for the things of God have waxed cold cold and colder maybe you never had have had a relationship with God I trust that God's spirit will show you your need that's in your heart even so some will not be changed you go back to school you go back to your job you go back to your home and soon this service will be a memory Soon this service will be forgotten. Just like a piece of metal. You heat it and you let it get cold. You heat it and you let it get cold. And you that have worked in metal, you know that once you do that, it hardens the metal. Heat, cold. Heat, cold. Until the metal can't even be chipped. And you can grow harder and harder, set through a service and the warmth of God and walk out on Him only makes us, and I'm talking about every one of us. I'm not preaching to one individual. I know some of you think I am. Amen. And I struggle with this service. I told Pastor Steve, I said, I said, God's laid this on my heart, but I'm just afraid to give it. And I gave him an alternative. 
I said, here's another message that if I can't do this, I'll preach it. Because we have lost our desire. You will have learned to live without God. I got a story here that I'm not even going to share. But I want you to stand. I want the music to get ready to come. Every head bow, every eye closed right now. Nobody looking around. Except Sister Kathleen as she walks to the platform. <laughs> Father, I pray that this burden that I have felt for about two weeks, I pray that through me being obedient to you this morning, God, that you will just release it. Take this heaviness from my heart. I know we're living in the last hour. I know we're living in the last days. And if you're not where you need to be with God this morning, all it takes is one service that can change the entire direction of your life. I walked into Sandwich, Illinois in November of 1971. The night before I was drunk, a lady knocked on my door. So I want you to come to church tomorrow night. We're having a revival. I smoked two and a half packs of cigarettes a day. I was drunk three to five times a week. I never did come to the altar. I just knelt in my seat and some people gathered around me and prayed with me and I said, God, please forgive me. I've been so wrong. I don't know how long I cried. It was, seemed like it was forever. But when I got up from there, I felt the burden of that sin lift from me. And I went outside and I threw my cigarettes out the window. And I went home and I emptied every beer that was in the refrigerator. And to the testimony that God has given me, I have never had a cigarette or a beer since. It was that one service that changed my direction. I have a preacher's son now that I would ne never have if I had not listened to the call of God. Every one of my girls knows what it takes to have a relationship with God. They would have never known that if I hadn't given my life to the Lord that Sunday night in November 1971. So I'm asking you here today, if you've never repented of your sins, it's just saying, God, I am a sinner. Please forgive me of everything I've ever done. You don't have to name them. All you got to do is just tell him. And the Bible says that he's just and he's righteous enough to wash those sins away. And after you feel that burden of sin lift you, Bible says, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What an awesome gift that is. As she's playing very softly, 
I want somebody, if somebody would just step out and say, God, today's my day. I know you're real. I want to change my life. And when they come, if they come, and when they come, do me a favor. Don't, don't necessarily just lay hands on everybody because some people don't like that. Just stand around them and pray with them. 